So thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to see you all here at Salon QP. Um, I'll just briefly start off and open up for you, and Carrie will take over discussing the first section. The book is divided into uh, various sections, and the purpose of it was to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the founding of Carrie's Independent Workshop, which is a major event for any watchmaker, and in addition, his first 30 years as a watchmaker. So that was the, the leading start to the story. And furthermore, I've known Kari now since this workshop began. I've been following this process uh, as a journalist in the beginning years and later as a good friend. And the time was ripe, so this book has taken more or less 12 years of time and patience to go through, and the moment to celebrate is here. So I'm going to give the word to Kari to talk about the first sections. So at the, if I shall, I mean, few words about the book. I mean, the beginning of the, the book, it explains my history, where I'm coming, uh, who I am, and uh, I mean, of course, the childhood and all that has an influence for our future life, and uh, it's the case as well with me. And, and uh, also the Finnish, uh, I mean, living in Finland, the Finnish nature, and the rush uh, winters and uh, the seasons uh, gives an influence, and as well the Finnish um, uh, design, the design and uh, uh, the nature, it keeps and it has an influence of, for, for one watches and I like uh, pure things and I don't like gimmicks and I don't like uh, when it's too busy or like that. So these things we find also from Finland and when we look at the Finnish architecture or the Finnish uh, design or furnitures or Scandinavian design, it's, it's, it's rather the same. Yeah, I think we don't know it, but in the Swiss watch industry, uh, in almost every house of the industry, of Patek Philippe, Vacheron, everywhere, you'll find Finnish watchmakers. And many people don't know that, but Finland has an excellent school of watchmaking, and they supply Switzerland with super specialists. They have a very good school. And there's a lot of similarities that struck me in the beginning, that actually, if you look at Finland and Switzerland, mm. the high-end Swiss watchmakers are all working in the snow, that's how it started. That's why you see cows and watchmaking. In the summertime, they're dealing with the cows. In the wintertime, the snow is literally this high or even higher. And the farmers would go up into their top part of their barns and work on watchmaking. That's how the watch industry really was born in Switzerland, to use those dark hours in the winter when the cows are inside. And okay, it's going back many years, but it's still a bit like that today. And Finland is very similar. You have very desolate periods in which the sun is down, there's a lot of snow, and it's a very good thing for the calm you need to do very fine horological masterpieces. The Finnish watchmaking school, it's interesting. It's the only school in the world which is a private school, and it's a school which is owned by a Finnish Watchmakers Association through uh, a foundation. So it's a private school owned by watchmakers, and it's the only school in the world like that, and it gives a special spirit for the school. The teachers, they are not uh, government functionists or the government employees, they are the employees of the private school, and it gives a different, and, and we can f see that uh, from the results of the, the, the education and the level of the watchmaking. Cool. Most people think of their high street specialist who changes the battery in their quartz watch or puts a strap on their Patek Philippe as a watchmaker. Now, they may have a certain training, but they're not watchmakers. And I keep saying again and again, I prefer the 18th century terminology. I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy. If a watchmaker is a watchmaker, he can take a piece of paper, blank, sit down with a pencil, make a drawing, and manufacture the whole thing, except perhaps for a few pieces like sapphire glass or other bits, either by himself or with the use of basic tools. And that's a watchmaker. And most of the people who are working in the industry today have a very important job. They're called rehabilitateurs. These are repairers slash makers. And they're very specialist, and I'm not putting them down. But they are assembling basically the parts at the end of the line, OK? The designs have been made. The parts have been manufactured, angled, finished. And they get a kit, three little boxes or two, depending on the complication, with all the different pieces inside. And they assemble that. And it's a difficult job. But the parallel of calling them watchmakers is like saying someone who's assembling a jet engine of an aircraft is a, is a jet designer. He's not a jet designer, he's an assembler. And it's a very important job in Switzerland, but there's a very fine definition, or clear definition, I can better say, between who is a watchmaker and who is simply a rehabilitateur 
working in the industry, very important people, but there's very few people like Kari in the world today. I count, in my knowledge, only less than 10 people in the world who can really take a piece of paper, get an idea, go through it, and produce a watch. So. And that's something that we don't have a, a education for that. But that's also, the education is that watchmaker, we, we learn how to repair watches, and then there's a schools that we learn how to do the uh, design of the watches, and then schools or technic those mechanical guys, they know how to fabricate. But there are a lot of uh, professions what we have to handle. And to learn all that, it comes by passion. That, uh, like by myself, that I like what I'm doing. And, uh, and I, I, I'm also willing to learn. I accept that I don't know everything at all, so I'm, I'm hungry to learn. And <coughs> with this attitude, we can learn. And, uh, and what, what, for instance, by myself I'm doing, I have to know a lot of professions, and, and that's a difficult task. <laughs> this is actually a picture of one of the first chronographs Kari did, I believe it was 2005 or six. Uh, this, this yeah, no, no, yeah, I presented, but I, I studied 2002. 2002. So this is the way it would start. It's a pencil drawing, just on paper. This is not on the screen even. This is just really a basic concept. Because many things are defined in a picture like this. You have your lugs are defined, the kind of look. Is it going to be modernistic or looking a little bit back? You have all of these decisions to make about the size of subdials, how they interact together, the relationship of hand proportions, the width of your bezel, the way the bezel meets the glass. So it looks like a simple thing. But with that drawing, you've decided all those issues. In addition, you've decided where certain gearing is going to go. And that means you know where to put your balance, balance wheel, your winding barrel, and all the other parts of the going train. So these decisions are radical decisions. It looks like nothing. And I can maybe diverge a little bit. I remember a time I went to interview uh, Ulysse Nardin and went in, there were a beautiful batch of drawings they had on their desk. And I said, oh, are these going to be the new pieces that you're going to make? I said, no, Rolf Schneider was still alive back then. He said, no, it's all, it's all actually shit what's on the table. I said, what do you mean? He said, none of these designers took a look where the movement to construction is. They have seconds moving in places we can't put them. They have the subdial in the wrong place. They have a place where a winding barrel is, they have something else. That's what I mean about watchmaking. This starts really from a concept and goes from the watch outside in. And for me, as a collector, this is really important because it means that you have a holistic piece, the design of the piece as a concept exterior-wise, and everything going inside the same. It's not a movement taken and plopped in. It's something very special. Nothing wrong with using other movements. In fact, Kari used them a lot. We'll get to that in a second. But at this point, this is a design that's coming right from the dial case inwards. And it's the, the proportions, but it, it comes also from a uh, so, sort of learning procedure. For, like for me, that by making restoration, we learn. I mean, we see the proportions, and then we can judge by ourselves that this is nice, this is not nice. It's also a question of the taste. But for me, it comes from the experience also. Mm -hmm. but the design, but also the practical things. When we repair watches, we can see that this is the shape of the watch which will pass the test of time, and this is the shape of the watch or the case which won't pass the test of time, that some shapes we can repolish the case and it will remain as new, and some shapes, if it's something very sharp or, or something like that, it won't pass the test of time. Or if we use some treatments, or we had those famous watches in the 40s, 50s, 60s with the gold plating, or me can tell it was doing millions of those watches, and all of, a um, lot of watches today, they are on the graveyard because uh, the case is completely worn out and we can't redo, redo them anymore. But the movements are still, it, it, they might be even like new because it's a classical watchmaking, but the case is not possible to redo anymore. And that's uh, one aspect of the, this is one of Carrie's uh, first pieces, pocket watch, that he made himself. Maybe you can tell a little bit about that this was, watch. I, I made my watchmaking school in Finland, and then I was working in Finland. I, I wanted to learn more. I went to Switzerland in 1988, 
to learn more, to make further education. I came back to Finland for one year, and I was working first time at, as an independent. It was 1988. 18, 1989, I went back to Switzerland to, to, make a, to do the course of complicated watches. And, and I get that spirit. It's a feeling that when you go to the castle and you open the first door, it's like, wow. And then you go further and you open the next door, like, wow. And it, you just discover something new and new all the time. And it was, for me, it was like that. So I wanted to go back to Switzerland and learn something more. And I had a great chance to be able to work uh, or start to work in Parmesan in 1990. So I went to the small workshop. It was a small workshop, 25 people at that time. And, uh, and uh, um, I was working in a small uh, p uh, room. I was 28, year, 28 years old and my colleague was 70 years old, Mr. Miller. <laughs> and uh, Charles, he was somebody who was pushing when he's, he was a very square people, that, a person that if he liked, he was very friendly and he could be very cold if he didn't like. <laughs> anyway, I get very lo well along with him and he was pushing me immediately, you should make a watch. And I started to work and Michel Parmigiani was, he said, that, yeah, you, you can use the infrastructure as you want and you can work during the evenings. And, but in the same time, when I went to Parmigiani, he said, that, you know, I offer you a chair and a bench. No, not the bench, light and the bench. I had to buy my first chair. <laughs> to sit. 250 francs. It was bloody expensive for me at that time, 1990. <laughs> and, I, and I had to bring all my tools, and I didn't have any more tools at home. So anyway, I started to, so I was working during the nights in the Parmigiani and, and doing small repairs, and I earned some money, and I, I was starting to build up my workshop at home. And I, it took me three, three and a half years from all my evenings and weekends. I made this piece, a pocket watch with a two beyond and um, one minute two beyond with two barrels matching directly with the center wheel and then uh, with power reserve indication. So I, it, I, I finished this watch 1994 and it was exhibited in the uh, Watch Museum of La Chotefond. There was a, a Tourbillon exhibition in 1996, which was sponsored by Gérard Perreco. And that was also something important for my future life, because I, when watch was exhibited, I met some other collectors, and I get more work, what we will see later on. Like many independent watchmakers, you usually start off making watches for yourself next to working for other people. And the phrase is actually right here on the, on the screen, but he was talking with Philippe Dufour, and, uh, who you all know, I'm sure. And Philippe said, you know, in 2002, it's really time you went off and took the plunge and became independent as a watchmaker and made your own shop. So that was a, a push out of the nest of <laughs> the watchmakers to go out and do it. And, there was a, yeah. because then um, I made one mini trip here, one customer in 1996. So I get some cash and buy more tools at home. Then um, another collector gave me a, uh, it was Ulysse Nachadan et Bosch, the pocket, uh, the small baby chronometer. And he asked that if I could do something special for him. And I was thinking, that, yeah. So I, I made a uh, tourbillon with a constant force escapement. And that took me five years. I completed the watch in 2000. And, and I was, uh, I, keep, uh, I, I, I finished to work in Parmesan in 1999. And I went to work for the watchmaking school as a teacher. And the deal was that I was supposed to work 50%, but it ended up that I was working 150%. And I didn't have any more time for me. And already in 1999, my workshop wasn't anymore at home. I had too much tools, and uh, I had to rent a small apartment in the village. So I had my workshop out of home already, even though I was working in the school at that time. And, um, and then, in 2002, when I started as an independent, my, I, had, I, I started um, to work for other companies. And to work for other companies was a great experience, because I learned what not to do. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, but I, I know at least what I shouldn't do. And I learned also my previous experience, you know, I, uh, I saw what happened with Mr. Parmigiani when 
he told his company all that. So I, a few things, but I will tell later on. Uh, but with watches that uh, I work for another companies, and there was a, one construction and prototyping for the one company, which was presented in Basel Fair, and it was supposed to be a big secret. And anyhow, uh, Philippe Dufour said that it's a great watch, but you should do it by, for yourself and not for the others. And that was a, like a turning point. That was 2004. That's the way it used to be. That's Kari's former first workshop, which was over a supermarket in a little That's village a called Motier. Second workshop. Second workshop over the supermarket in a place called Motier. And uh, he had, a, it was basically an apartment, you know, just a living apartment. And then another room came, and then a, a room next to that, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and things slowly grew from there. And it, and it was filling, up, filling with, when I started 2000, uh, Two, I was first alone, and I, I had a big dream that I will work purely alone. And I noticed very soon that it's impossible because it's. Um, I'm not the person that I'm talking a lot, but still it, it was too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, that was a reason. And then also I noticed that if I want to do something, uh, it's too difficult. And if I want to make a big important watch, too too difficult. And I decided that I will have perhaps a few persons with me. So 2004, I had a first watchmaker working with me. Now, now, during this period of time, it's important to point out that Kari was using movements from other makers for his watches. But these were antique movements, what I would call antique eboche that he found locally. That's where the observatory series, if you heard about, started up. These were watches that were made for actually being used for um, chronometer examinations at uh, Neuchâtel and elsewhere. And they formed a kind of a basis. And this is a problem all independent watchmakers have. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. When you're independent, you don't have the funding that large corporations have. So you literally have to get the money together and the time to make your own movement. So almost every independent you'll speak to from whatever genre will be working with other movements, changing them, maybe improving them, and going further. So I always say, for Kari's early works, you were buying two watches. You were buying a very fine Bosch from a very antique fine piece, and a Kari Wurtlin in one, in one watch. You were buying actually two watches. And that changed recently. The book also celebrates that, and we'll come back to that in detail at the end. Um, Kari has developed also his own movement the past years and is now making his own movement, completely his own design, with his own design of escapement as well, uh, in-house at his new workshop. So we'll cover that at the end of the story, but that's also part of the celebration here today. But perhaps also that, also that when I was working for, for the co companies, um, it's also um, the reward. So I found that it was, it was not so... Uh, rewarding to work for the companies. My very first work when I started 2002 was a pocket watch for a big company, uh, which was a Bosch, but I had to make build a tourbillon and a minute repeater, perpetual calendar, chronograph, split chronograph, and then a power reserve indication. So I had to take care of that. It took me two and a half years uh, that was my first work as an as a independent, including some restoration, what I did. But that was something I did, uh, and it was a lot of, lot of work. And then I did a lot of construction work and prototyping or assembling movements for uh, several companies. And, but I find that it was interesting, but always there was something. Companies want to have a faster and this and that. And, and and I, I decided that it's a good start. I, will, I can start my, to, my, to do my watches uh, in the more serious way, <laughs> but I can remain independent because I can finance my, my work by doing for others. And that was the main reason why I was working for others. It may be a taste question, and tastes are never the same for everybody, but uh, I think you'll agree with me that every watchmaker finds their language of visual design combined with their mechanical work. And with Kari, it's the same. Very early on, there was a, a look, a concept of case design, looking back 
to the beautiful cases of the 40s and 50s, the case and the bezel complement, the crown complements that, the use of guilloche, which is actually looking back to the 18th century, but all the patterns are not quite 18th century, they're actually new patterns that he de designed or traditional ones that were being interpreted. The hands look at first glance like Breguet hands, a typical 18th century hands. They're called Breguet hands, but you'll see Breguet hands in the 18th century on all watches from that period. They were very, very popular. It wasn't really even known as a Breguet hand back then. But his version is very different. It has a much bigger circle, the bluing and the gold contrast. This is like a modern idea also with the numerals this way. So what you have in my view, but I'm just describing it my way, is a watch which is taking classical elements that most of us love from the past, but giving them a freshness and a reinterpretation for the present. And Kari's watches, whether they're rectangular or round or any other shape, they're always in this domain. And I think that's really, I always take my hat off to Kari for that, because this is extremely difficult to achieve. First of all, to make the watch, but to achieve a design that going to last and will look good in 50 years or 100 years. It's very hard to do. The interesting thing that my, when I finished my pocket watch, I, had, I met that one collector, and he asked me to do a mini repeater for him. So it was a Ebosch movement, and he said that, that uh, he wants to have, a, I think it was 37 millimeter case, and said that I mean, the design is up to you. I mean, so I was thinking, and the design of the case is almost like that, with the teardrop plugs and uh, the, the form of the, the, the case band is it's, it's very similar. You'll see more of the watches at the end of the Because I, I really like that. And that's also the, because of the, we can repolish the case as many times as we want, and it remains the same. Yeah, what he's describing is maybe not so clear for everybody, because if there's a curve of a watch which will not fit against a polishing wheel or a polishing surface, it means you're going to deform the surface when you polish it. So a watchmaker who's looking 50 or 60 or 100 years ahead is making a case design, the way the lugs go away from the body, the way the bezel is shaped, that will fit the patterns of a normal polishing system. If you don't do that, and you make some really strange, sharp edge that looks cool, that's going to get worn down because the, the polisher can literally not get it into that position against the turning piece. So it sounds very simple, but it's something you have to think about. And this is a sentence that, for me, epitomizes all independence. You come to a point which you make a watch for yourself. People like it. You make one for your wife or your kids or something like that. And suddenly somebody says, that's beautiful. Can you make me one? So that's why I put this phrase in here, because that's essentially what happened to Kari. People began coming to him. They liked what they saw. And it literally grew from these few first watches that you made. Yeah. So that's very often the case that people are coming. They see something, customers, and then they want to have something a bit like that, but something else. But uh, that's a nice challenge for us. So now we're going into more details about the workshop, working methods, and tools. And I hope I will keep you active and awake during that period. <laughs> this is the new workshop, the staircase going down. It's a new building. And uh, Kari was very lucky. There was a friend from their family who had this beautiful uh, location that you could live in and have a workshop and everything under one roof. And he knew Kari and his wife very well and he offered them the house uh, and they were able to move in. And now everything is real, literally under one roof, the living quarters and the workshop, the machine park, everything is all in one area. This is just a view of the staircase by the photographer Ralph uh, Baum Baumgartner, who's very well known with watch photography. It's one of his specialties. He did most of the, most of the work on this book of photography. It's a close-up view of the movement. Now I'll go back one second because maybe I should explain. This is what they call anglage. And maybe those of you who know, forgive me for repeating. And anglage is the rounding off of the edge of the plates of the watch. It's a very specific thing. Philippe Dufour told me once that he could tell which people were doing which parts by looking at the way it was done because there's several factors involved. The angle of sharpness, whether it's rounded or flat, and this takes seven to eight different steps to achieve. So you not only have to file it into position, the polishing takes many different steps. So this is a very typical thing that we expect from high-end watches. Now, I have to say, for clarity's sake, anglage doesn't affect timekeeping. Rolexes keep perfect time without having any anglage whatsoever inside. 
But when you buy a high-end watch like that and you want quality, you're looking for these kinds of aspects. And I wanted to make a parallel in the book that is identical to what we see in fine violins. Stradivari or Guarneri will have a very specific edge rounding. Same way, the sharpness of the angle, the way the angle is rounded, the way it's finished at the end. And a real expert, if there's two, in, two violins, I'm not sure if it's a Guarneri or a Strad, there's no label, it's missing, they can judge usually from the rounding what's going on. So this is a small detail, it's a very fine telltale sign of the quality in the watch and who made it and how it was made. So in the book, we're trying in this section to bring more different themes in to make it um, a more broad-based uh, concept than just about watches, 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 and kari, kari, kari. It's what kari does in the concept of, of a broader total. Mm. And it's the details which makes the whole thing. And when we have a nice details, we don't even see the details. We just see that it's nice yeah. without seeing the details. But when the details are missing, we say, hmm, something is missing. <laughs> Magic isn't there. I also tried to make a parallel here with, uh, because I, I do like Japanese pottery very much. Um, a potter has the same problem. He has to get clay. It has to be the correct type. He might make seven identical pots, fire them, and they'll all be a little bit different when they come out of the oven because the oven changes things. The way it's been made is slightly different each time, but they'll all be identical in the sense of coming from the one person's signature in hand, but they'll be very, very different. And also, what I'm talking about here, I always say to my friends, you know, this watch is alive and this one is dead. And they say to me, are you, are you crazy? I said, no, because if you have a piece of metal and you spend a lot of time with that and you're getting the edges rounded and you're putting a lot of energy into this thing, it becomes almost alive when you look at it. It, has, it, it, it vibrates, it has something really beautiful about it. And you look at something coming from a factory Nothing against factory watches, I have them too. But it's a different kind of look. It's the handmade workmanship, the little variations of human element that make a watch, in my view, uh, alive at that point. And I'd make the parallel here that, you know, in Japan, a product like this, a utilitarian product, is for drinking tea, would be given almost mystical status. They would consider it really almost like a living entity with the respects that we wouldn't even give most products that we use. And I kind of like that idea because I also see other watch people getting the same feeling. They find something fascinating about a handmade watch by an independent, and they can't quite put their finger on it, but it has to do with all those little variations, those little bits that you can't quite put under your finger that add up to a very special picture. But that's my opinion. You have to decide for yourself what you think. No. Yeah. See a lot of details here also. This was a series of watches uh, made for a group of collectors. Um, one of them ordered a watch like this. His friends took a look and they all wanted different dials and different mm. combinations and you were very involved in working out all the different patterns for them within yeah. the context of the watch that you designed. So there's also some pictures about dials. We do dials also by ourselves. So we do machining fabrication procedure, but as well the decoration, the engine turning, with those antique ro rose engine and straight line machines. Yeah. I have one rose, rose engine and I have two straight lines. And we have one person, she has been making dials for 23 years now. Yeah. We don't think about that, but uh, a dial like this, let's say, not like this one, but this particular one, if you see the total picture, a dial like that will take about three days to manufacture for a person working eight hours a day for three days. So it just gives you an idea of the kind of time that's involved. It's a view of the movement. So there are, we're making unique pieces. That's the one, one watch which has a chronometer X game and it's a tourbillon. So I'm doing quite a lot of uh, unique pieces uh, some, some of them, they're more complicated or less complicated, but uh, that's something I like. And, 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 uh. and here we have the team at the workshop. So it's a very international, international group. At the, at the workshop today, I, I, started, I had the first watchmaker 2004, then we have been a bit more people, and then the, the starting, I mean, the turning point was two, 
I noticed that at the very beginning that I can continue like that. To be able to see uh, on the future and to face the future, the only way is um, to have your own movement. And then there's a few options. Either somebody is doing that for me or I buy parts or I do everything by myself. And I thought that perhaps the most uh, best way is to do it by myself. Then at least we will master what we are doing. And that's what we started to do. And that was the best decision what I made. And, but that, we need more people. That's why we are more people today. We have 15 people in my workshop. But we are making all the components today for the, our watches or for the movements what we are doing. And that uh, uh, gives us a liberty. But for the workshop, we need people. And I like people when they are coming somewhere else. I don't like that everybody's coming, the local people. I like when they don't know each other before. And we have only one boss in the workshop, it's me. And then it's very free, I, I'm not an administrative person, but I'm, I'm painful with the work, I want that it's done properly. So, uh, and I work in the workshop all the time, so I've spent about between 60% of my time making watches, so I'm in the workshop, so I, I see what's happening. And I don't want to do the construction on the screen, so I did that before, but now we have a one, one person doing that, and it's much better because uh, if I'm behind the screen, I don't, I'm not in the workshop, and I, I'm much better in the workshop uh, with people, and then I can show that that's the standard, because I, I've been doing that for all my life. So uh, I can show that you, you do like that, and that's, that's good. So I'm credible, and the people, they want to work with me, and, and, and that gives the, the, the positive energy for the workshop. And, Everything is going, I mean, easily and better. Yeah, it's a little thing, but it's quite important. In a, in a classical Swiss you know, workshop, you have Le Maître at the top, and everybody below, and they come and they show their piece, and he says, uh, yes, it's OK, or no, do this. And very Scandinavian is to have people very democratically working together. So Carrie's still the boss, but people will, for instance, you finish your turbine your own cage, you hand it to a colleague, and the colleague might say, well, this could be improved a little bit and you know, go back and forth. So there's a lot of democratic work on, on a, what I call a horizontal plane, which I think is great because it means that your workshop is really having an identity. And everybody in the workshop I spoke with, they're all interviewed and in the book, um, were very proud of the work they were doing and felt very good because they could stand and say, I made this, I did this part, and I'm responsible for this and did a good job. And that's rewarded in the context of the shop. And responsibility is given to you more and more the more you can do. And it's very international. You have Japanese, Finnish, French, along with the Swiss. And this mixture gives also, like Kari said, a very special energy. That's what I dis discovered there compared to other workshops I go to, that this is a very vibrant live workshop where people are very engaged with the product, which I think is a positive thing about the Scandinavian approach to you know, non-hierarchical structures uh, like mm -hmm. you would see elsewhere. Yeah. And that's, I think, for the, every company, it's the, um, the, the, the stuff, I mean, the person the people inside, that's the, the power of the company. I mean, like me, I'm, I, can, I can work and I can guide people, but I have to motivate people that they come with me. And, and, and at least in our case, that's the, what's happening. It's a view of the shop. You often have shops where the desks are just in lines behind each other looking at a wall, but here it's very spacious and airy. Things are at angles also to keep people in a fresh mood and also they can see what's happening around them in the shop. It's a very, it's a small thing, but a very important aspect. These are some great shots of tools and machines. We need machines, so to be able to make watches, I mean, that's, we need the ebosh, so we, we need main, main plate and bridges, and that's also the way that we have, a, those are computer-driven machines. I mean, people are always, like, it's a CNC machine, okay. but 200 years ago, it was, it was the same. They had the machines to mill. <laughs> but it was driven differently, and today it's still the same. It's a tool which is cutting the metal, but it's um, the, the, comp the, the program which is driving, and it's a person behind which makes the program and which gives the um, cleverness for the machine. That's a question that people often have about handmade watches, independent watches, and mass-produced watches, is they're both using machines, okay? But there's a key difference between those two in that in the mass-produced article, the machines are programmed. They can be programmed very finely. So let's say we have a hand for a watch. 
minute hand. If the program is done correctly, the hand can come out virtually finished and somebody will just give it a, a quick clean up and it goes into the watch literally seconds after it comes out of the machine. In this case, you have a hand being roughly cut out by a machine, but afterwards being very finely rounded and polished. For the base plates that Kari mentioned, you have to have very exact points in which everything is put in. So otherwise, your wheels will not be in the right spot to engage. So the machine is very good for these critical parts that have to be micron accurate. But after that, all the work is really being done by hand and being checked. Whereas in other companies, it's coming out pretty fast. So I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not saying this is superior to that. But I'm talking about the emotional value. If you pay the extra premium for the anglage, for the finishing, for the perlage, for the qualities that you want in an emotional piece, it's got to be in there. And that's my only point of contention here, is that many of us today are paying for a so-called quality level, which is basically being taken over by machines. And that's why I like independence so much, because they're the guys who are putting in the extra effort. It costs a lot more, but when you get it, it's something which is unique and very special, has been worked on in complete detail. It's these kinds of things and these kinds of people that make that happen. This is a funny story. I, I love these dirty old machines. I thought they were fantastic. And you'll never get a PR book from a watch company showing you stuff like this. They don't want to show you the grit and dirt. But that such gritty machines are part of the process of making a watch, I think is fascinating. And Kari showed me these, these machines and I went nuts. And I said, the photographer's got to come back and take these pictures. <laughs> you had a nice mm. story about these, I think. Yeah. It's a uh, factory in the next village in, Mont uh, in Fleurier. They were making uh, cutters to, to cut uh, teeth and pinions and all kind of things. And, and that's a, it was like a museum. And, and unfortunately, they had to close down. And I was fortunate enough to buy a, one part of their stock and machines. But, but if I would know before, I would buy the, the whole factory because that was a piece of museum. And uh, but yeah. unfortunately, it's really it's, fun. that wasn't the case. This is your typical guilloche machine. I think Kari can best explain that. That's a, so we have few, so this is the uh, Rose engine. It's a lathe and we have a cams and that's a, a Swiss made machine. And it's sort of Rolls Royce which, which will last forever. And, but due to the, uh, the cams and how we divide, we can create a lot of different patterns. But this is also the work which for us, it enables us to do dials which are personalized and, uh, and as we are make, we don't do work for other companies, we do only for us, so we are very reactive with that and it's a, uh, for our, at least for me, it's a really big pleasure to, to be able to do that. The explanation and in the book will be clearer, but these bits that Carrie just spoke about, they're called cams, they have different shapes, and there's a feeler touching these that tells the machine when to go in or go out against the dial in combination with the hand adjustment. So basically, this is hardware which is supplying software. Today, that would be a chip that big, but back then, you did it like this. And what Kari also alluded to is that the workshop's able to create their own cams, because if you want to make a special guilloche shape, square with diamonds and a little bit in the middle, patterned waves, whatever, you have to make the cams to be able to tell the machine how to make the dial. So he's really even controlling the machine on that level at the same time. And that, that's a profession which was extremely famous uh, 100 years ago. And it has been drying down all the time. And today, it's just ready to disappear. In Switzerland, the, the last company, uh, which is called, it was a, a major, uh, two brothers. They have about age of re, uh, retirement. They sold their company to the uh, one dial factory called Fair, and the dial factory, apparently they, have, they just want to use the whole workshop uh, to create the, uh, stamp, the, the patterns for the stamping dials, stamped dials. So it starts drying down, and Breguet has their own workshop, and then there's two other guys in the whole country, and it's, it's, it's art which is nice art, but it's, for me it's, it's ready to disappear. And the Swatch Group is buying every single lathe which is available in Switzerland. And they pay tens of thousands. 
extra money to get all these machines. It's a bit of a shame, but actually as collectors... It's just ready to disappear. Yeah, as collectors, you have to be aware of the fact that many of the guilloche dials you see in the market, I would say roughly about 70% or maybe even 80% of those are pressed guilloche. So they make a die with the shape of the guilloche pattern and they punch it into a soft metal in one shot and it looks roughly like that, but when you really look closely and you take a loop and you examine it under your eyes, you can see that it's just not as sharp and refined and the die also gets worn down so it loses the profilings. But if you're a real connoisseur, you get into those kind of things, you'll see your eyes will open up a bit, but we're kind of in a strange period with these disappearing trades like this. Here we go to the watches. So we'll go through these just quickly. This is um, one of the uh, latest unique piece what we made. It's a GMT function. We press the crown and the, the GMT hand jumps one hour ahead and then it has a special, it's a mini trip. Yeah, it's so this is, is up here showing 24 hours yeah. and pushing in here. Yeah. And then it's a decimal repeater. It strikes decimals hours, ten, 10 minutes and the following minutes. And then uh, it has a double case back and it has uh, engraving on the back and the normal work. So it's a sort of piece of art and technical piece in the same time. This is describing uh, in graphic terms the difference between the classical minute repeater and the decimal repeater that Kari developed. Um, classical repeater is very simple you get the hours as a, you have two gongs, okay, minute repeater. The low one is giving you the hours. The minutes are the high pitched, ting, ting, tong, tong, ting, ting. The quarters are done with a one high low, so one, one high, one low equals 15 minutes. Now that's all very well and good, but when you get to a time like 8.53, then you get, you have to add up in your head, you, you hear the eight, then you have to count, okay, it's 15, it's 30, it's 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. You've lost count by here. You've already lost what time it is, whether it's 8.50 or 8.51. The decimal version that Kari developed, here you have, again, this bit here, but then it gets to 8.53. You have 10, so it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and only three minutes. So it's much easier to remember the minutes are what get you in a minute repeater towards the end, towards nearing the close of the hour. That's where the counting gets kind of tricky. And that was also a development that Carrie brought out, how many, about seven years ago, mm. eight years ago? Yeah. It is also that when I was working in Parmesan, I did plenty of these uh, repeaters, the unique pieces, and I found them very um, illogical. <laughs> and that was the reason I was thinking that we should do something more logical. And, and a better method, yeah. yeah and then. This is the, one of the newest pieces, a chronograph. That's a chronograph, so it's a movement what I made at the base movement, and then we had, did add the, the moon phase and big date function on it, and uh, a series of 10 watches, uh, four, 40 millimeter case, and about all of those watches, they are different. So they are, but the case, the cases, they are the same mm -hmm. design, but uh, different materials, and then different dials. And this is the Vanked 8. This is the, the watch which epitomizes the new movement. This has the new movement inside. It's completely designed and made by Kari, built in-house by Kari, and also uses his new escapement. So this is really your moment to explain the escapement idea that you had. In that time, when I was, um, it started that in, when I was again in Parmigiani, I did also restoration, and I was involved with the one watch which was I think it's 1990, 1991. It was a Breguet po uh, pocket watch made by Breguet, and it was a tubio, and it had the, that natural escapement. And um, it was a teamwork. So uh, I did take care of the cage, and Michel Pamijan did take care of the movement. And once the, he was finished, I was finished <laughs> with the restoration. We put everything together, and that thing was running so well. After 200 years, the timing, we put in the timing machine, it was beating 21,600. 21, it was the frequency, and it was just dead straight line. I was amazed to see that after 200 years, and they didn't have timing machines. And, and it was keeping, I mean, really, 
And, and that thing uh, stayed in my mind that there's something special with this escapement. Of course, it's execution also, but when we think about 200 years ago, so uh, that brought me in the idea of that. And then I had several other experiences with other escapements. And then um, when I uh, actually before I started with our movement, I made first the prototype of the escapement. It was a sort of poor prototype that I did build up that one. The, another movement that it was. We could see the escapement, and and it was running really well. And I was said, "Wow!" And then I made the construction of the movement by thinking of the escapement that, that I put the escapement in the value, and some magic that we could hide the driving wheels, and uh, and at the beginning we get it almost right, and uh, the idea also I saw that with my prototype. But I expected as well that we need less energy, and and so there's two X cable wheels giving direct impulse, and there's a fork. Fork is only holding the X cable wheels during the oscillation of the balance, and and uh, it gives more performance, about 30 percent more, and and uh, so we had some prototype stages at the beginning, and and uh, but then we had another difficulties of the jewels that in Switzerland they can't do any more uh, special jewels or then companies are no more willing to do because they want to serve the big industry and to make few locking stones it's too much headache so we didn't find anybody in the whole world to do those we have asked in Switzerland Germany and Japan we even tried to China <laughs> nobody wants to do these jewels so we have to do them by now ourselves. He's talking about these two little bits here yeah. the jewels that work on the so we are grinding up by ourselves. Mm. But that's also something that the geometry of the wheels and the, how it works, uh, we are able to do these pieces by ourselves, we are able to finish these pieces ourselves, which is the liberty. So yeah, we're at the end of our discussion. We have five minutes available for question and answer. If anybody has anything they want to ask, you should feel free. Please. Sorry, what was the inspiration for the decimal repeatable? Well, I, I found that the illogical. The, I have old clocks and clocks, and I, they're always striking quarters and then half. And, and uh, I find it's more logical that it's striking tens. When it's 30, it's three times ding dong, instead of a ding dong ding on two quarters. And especially minute repeater when it's repeating minutes. So I find more logical when we are already in, in decimal system. Don't feel shy. When you started your career, where were your biggest inspirations? When I, yeah, well, when I, my biggest inspiration is that there are a few gentlemen. It's called Mr. Miklos. Mr. Miklos is a, he's a, he's not a watchmaker. He's a teacher in the school for the boys, but he has learned in Germany, uh, he, and he's self-taught. He's a collector, important collector, and he has learned by collecting. He has tubions and all kinds of things, but we can imagine on the world. Uh, but uh, he is making only pocket watches, chronometer escapements. I have visited him many times when I was young, and that was something, uh, it gave me a big inspiration. And, and another person is uh, Mr. Parmigiani, for instance. He's, uh, he's very creative, and he has been to restoration, and, and uh, when I worked with him, he was always full of enthusiasm. And, so these people give the inspiration. And then also those masters uh, in the past, because I've been working with their watches. And, you, and that's also that has struck me that you pick up the watch, which is 200 years old, uh, like pocket watches from Breguet, those half court repeaters. You disassemble the watch, and you, you do cleaning and restoration. You have a barrel, which is after 200 years, there's no play. It's like new. I mean, how they did it. 
And today we have a new watch, this, I don't know, I mean, new movements from somewhere, but, you know, those famous uh, movement manufacturers from Switzerland. After one year, you have a barrel which is completely, I mean, so much play that it's finished after one year. And that one is 200 years and it's like a new. Yeah, just, just to add to this, to this subject, um, it was a Giulio Papi from Audemars Piguet, Rino et Papi, said to me, you know, a car you can put on a test bank and put a brick on the gas pedal and just drive it for 160 kilometers an hour and when the engine breaks you take it off and you analyze what gear broke, what camshaft split. But you can't speed a watch up. You speed it up, you don't see anything. So re restoration and repair is where most watchmakers get to see, ah, this solution doesn't work and this one is really good. So that's the way you really have to find out what's going to work and function for long term by looking to the past and then doing it in the future. And I would add that most of us don't realize before the atomic timekeeping came in the 1950s, they were still using old ship's board chronometers made in 1840, 1850 in the navies around the world. We have records still from France, from Loire, for instance, 1840 board chronometer in a box, brass. It's been going since 1840 with just a cleaning every six years or so. And they were using it in submarines up until about 1855, in some cases 1967. So you have to imagine if a watch is well made, it should last for forever, basically. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I always get carried. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, in that case, I thank you for the both of us for coming and spending your time with us. And it's time to sign the books for those lucky 10 people who... And I... <laughs> Thank you.